those days we had a Cold War mission, primarily during that time was reconnaissance, selecting targets both East Berlin and also eastern part of Germany, and conducted different exercises with the uh, other units such as the British SAS. Of course, the uh, SAS, they did not call themselves SAS, nor could we call ourselves being Special Forces men. Due to the Four Powers Potsdam Agreement, you could not station any commando or sabotage troops. So, of course, the Russians had their Spetsnaz, British SAS, and we had called Dere. However, before you could be assigned to Dere, you had to speak an East European language, either German, Hungarian, Russian, Polish. In my case, since I spoke fluent Ukrainian, I speak Russian, German, I was assigned to Dere. Upon arrival in Dere, first of all, they gave you different documentation using pseudonyms and, of course, gave you money for civilian clothes. You grew your hair long and uh, in order to better blend, blend in with the German population. We had, I would say, probably about 50 percent of them were uh, uh, foreign born or they had ethnic backgrounds such as being Polish, German, Hungarian. So it was almost like a French Foreign Legion. So and uh, generally as a rule we all lived, if you were married you lived on the economy and we had of course a stay behind mission in the event that the Warsaw Pact forces, the Soviets overran Berlin, our job was to hit certain targets, to include certain critical American facilities such as the uh, ASA, NSA facility uh, units of that, of that nature. Now the day that uh, wall went up, I remember our commander coming in, he said, balloon is up, and everybody's, you know, panicking, what's going to happen, tanks rolling. Finally, he comes in, he says, settle down. He says, our State Department's not going to do anything. Now, it was a very interesting scenario because prior to that, the Russian officers also could shop in a commissary, PX, and we went to the same nightclubs in Berlin. It's still nothing was happening. So it was very, very interesting period. And of course, uh, we were involved in so-called tradecraft or as the agency guys would refer to it, uh, everything from red lines, dead letter drops, cutouts, and this day and age when they talk about uh, kidnapping terrorists, well, we even practice that, but we called it snatching. And then my unit would be tasked to provide us support, for example, and they would tell that agent, said, okay, you go to such and such corner, such and such a bus stop, have the German Stern magazine under your armpit as a bona fides or a method of recogni recognition. And if so-and-so will show up with a German, what they call uh, the Berliner Zeitung or German daily newspaper, and that way you will communicate. Of course, what he didn't realize and they didn't tell him, a guy would show up, one of our guys, civilian clothes, would sit, behind, sit beside him, pretending like, you know, he's just another guy waiting for a bus. And then another guy would show up, sit next to him. Next thing you know, he pulls up a car, we grab his butt, throw him in the car, blindfold, and off we go. So now, once the wall went up, it was difficult. It was difficult. Prior to that, it was no problem. But once the wall went up, you were restricted. You had to go through uh, Checkpoint Charlie, as they called it, you know. And of course, you were Unless you were in uniform and you were part of the military liaison mission, you couldn't go any longer. The only thing we had were our shirts and our backs and what we could carry. We had to wait almost three years before we could immigrate to the United States. And then we needed a job, we needed a sponsor. So I joined the Army. The Army sent me to college, get my degree, sent me to get my master's degree move up the ranks, therefore anyone that complains about this country that, you know, you can't make it, then I have a few words for them.